Good afternoon, everyone. I don't think I need to ask if this speaker is working. This is one powerful speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Poole, Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at the University of Tennessee. Before I introduce our lecturer, Tom Main, I'd like to thank General Shale for their generous support of this lecture and for being the platinum funder for our 50th anniversary celebration. Since 1980, General Shell has provided more than $500,000 in scholarships, lectures, and funding for special projects in our college, which means they've supported the education of dozens of students and advanced the goals and academic ideals of our college. Thank you, General Shell. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Tom Main, principal of internationally acclaimed architectural practice, Morphosis. We're so fortunate to have him with us today for our 50th anniversary celebration, because while we're enjoying looking back at the past 50 years, the future is actually in front of us. This is the beginning, the first day of our next 50 years. Why is Tom Main's work so important for the beginning of our next 50 years? Here's why. Because from the start, he has been fresh and innovative, inventive and experimental. As a thought leader, author, teacher, and architect, he has continuously and effectively challenged the status quo. In fact, next to status quo in the dictionary, it might have the antithesis, his face. <laughs> And that's a lesson of, of persistence that we can all learn from. With several colleagues in 1972, he founded one of the most forward-looking schools in the world, the Southern California Institute of Architecture. That same year, with three colleagues, he founded Morphosis, a collective practice uh, working from, from the scale of the spoon to the city, from graphics, watches, and teapots, to restaurant interiors, civic architecture, and urban design. That willingness to expand design horizons and that thirst for expression are ideals we can use every day. Today, work by Morphosis spans the globe. As their work expanded in size and scope, it remained edgy. If it was sharp and striking in the 1970s, when it was new, it's equally intense and intriguing now. Recent work ranges from plans for the tallest tower in Europe an 80-story reflective glass tower in the Alpine village of Val, Switzerland, to a 23,000 square meter campus integrating architecture and landscape in Shanghai, China. In February, Morphosis won a Progressive Architecture Award for a 1.19 million square foot tower project in Shenzhen, China. It was their 25th PA award. Tom Main's work is important to architecture because it relentlessly embodies new and untested ideas. If I could use just two words to characterize Morphos's work, it would be high performance. High environmental performance, high skin performance, high social performance, high cultural performance, and of course, high aesthetic performance. Moreover, Morphos's work aspires to high psychological performance, focusing on the deep, emotional responses that can be fulfilled by specific architectural moments. That's why this work is so important to the world, because it elevates our notion of function and returns us to first principles. In this regard, Tom reminds me of the artist and fellow Southern Californian Robert Irwin, who finds beauty in fundamental questions pursued with single-minded intensity. Throughout his career, Tom made his intertwined education and practice research and design. Immersed in teaching since the early 1970s, he is presently a distinguished professor at UCLA and has lectured and taught as a guest professor at universities throughout the world, inspiring the imagination of young architects and designers, including many right here in Knoxville, including some of our faculty, in fact. Tom's honors include, among many others, the Rome Prize, the AIA Gold Medal, the Centennial Medal from the American Academy in Rome, the McDowell, McDowell Medal, the National Design Award,
from the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. And in 2005, Tom was awarded the Pritzker Architecture Prize, considered by many to be the most prestigious honor in the world of architecture. Interestingly, Tom found out he won the award when he received a call on his cell phone from Pritzker Prize Director Bill Lacey, who, as many of you know, was the first dean of this college in 1965 when it was the new school of architecture. As design director of Morphosis, Tom leads a firm of over 50 architects and designers located in New York City and Los Angeles. Published extensively, the firm's buildings and projects have been the subject of over 23 monographs and numerous ex exhibitions worldwide. Following the lecture this afternoon, Tom will sign books, uh, his new book, uh, one of his new books, Combinatory Urbanism, and any other books by, on Morphosis that you have. In the second floor gallery, the ushers will show you the way there. And with that, please join me in welcoming Tom Main. Probably should turn this thing on, shouldn't I? just talk for sure. Okay. <laughs> uh oh, it's over. Okay. It's um really nice to be here today. It's a uh, r real pleasure to be invited for your, um, your 50th anniversary. And I, I put together a, um, a talk, a really a conversation maybe, that's uh, hopefully somewhat connected to this. And that um, recently I've been thinking about um, how to talk about um, our work, um, our work, Morphosis, uh, my collective work. And um, it occurred to me that I've been practicing for quite a while and, and it really doesn't make sense to explain, especially the, the, the work, the current work, the new work, um, as in an isolated way, and then it, it really is very much about its development of, um, that comes from asking questions um, in, in four decades, actually. And um, what I've done is I put together um, the work that begins with my schoolwork, and this is very much for you, the students there, and that hopefully it's going to be interesting to you that as you're searching for your own way out of... Um, out of your education, your academic work. Um, there's no answer, and I don't in any way claim to show this as a, uh, as a prototype or as a literal kind of notion of, of where you should go. It's more just looking at um, my way, the way that was um, somehow just happened. And again, um, I've, I've never had any kind of a goal to go anywhere. I've never had any kind of trajectory. I just show up to work every day and ask questions. And um, it was mentioned about inquiry or, or um, the notion of kind of challenging. And it's the basis of architecture, I think, because we, we um, look at the world and we understand our art form as a, um, a social, cultural, political, ecological, urban form. And it's endless in the information that it can, um, it can withstand. And we just ask questions. And I think really the, the differences in our architecture of various architects is as much to do with about um, the nature, the type of questions we ask and how voracious we are, how, uh, the kind of appetite we have for asking those questions. Is there a possibility you could turn a little bit of the light on in the house, whoever I'm talking to, <laughs> in the back somewhere that I can't see? So I'm gonna, um, it's, What's going to happen here that might seem, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really weird to look in the pure black, like you don't, ex <laughs> you don't exist. And um, it's funny, this is the, the weirdest form for me to communicate. I'm a, a dialogue person, and I like um, the conversation that, that, that'll happen later. Um, 
But I'm going to take you through um, my own kind of development and, um, and the kind of questions I was asking and the kind of issues. And I'm not interested in explaining the projects because that's a complete different thing. And in fact, to really explain one project, would, you, you would take an hour anyway. But the, the issues that were taking place as we, we started, and again, just like you'll start, um, from um, a certain level of naivete, a certain level of the lack of experience, the lack of knowledge, and you're just going out in the world and trying to figure out, given what you left school with, um, what it means to be an architect. And you're, you're just asking questions at all, all kinds of levels. And, and, but what will happen here is I take you through this, um, mm, this, this series of very circuitous kind of adventures, um, is that it, there's no cl cleanness to the events. They're very non sequitur, and the, the architects out there know that. The work shows up, and you're not in control of your own life in that sense. It's not like you're pursuing a particular concept or a series of ideas that have a continuity. They're just showing up, and the continuity is going to take place in a much more complicated way over time. And so the, I've showed it pretty much the way it showed up in my office. And it's going to be very, very random, and I'm going to try to glue it together with my thinking. Um, I'm going to show two projects that I did in, in uh, my undergraduate education. And um, hopefully this will happen to you. Um, when I was working on them, they made just about no sense to me. I didn't really get it. And um, there, there was an idea that gave us this really simple problem of putting a dot on a line. And we're supposed to organize the line to its maximum degree. And the dot was not in the center. And everybody put it in the center, and that means you're automatically a classicist who was part of the old world. And the notion was maximum differentiation. And mm, it seemed a bit interesting, uh, but I didn't quite get it. And then with that, um, we were interested in the dynamicism of time. And these, the opening of the hibiscus flower and the closing over time was, again, a symbol of that. And then um, this notion, and it came from um, Professor Ralph Knowles, who was my third and fourth year professor, we were making these very, very complex forms that came from wind, water, and sun forces. And um, again, uh, we were, he was quite ahead of his time. He's maybe still ahead of his time. And it was quite abstract. And it was at a time of architecture, which maybe again, strangely enough, again, I'm talking to you students, that we're inhabiting. And that modernism had pretty much become exhausted. This is 1968, 1969. We were about to head into what we called postmodernism, which is a kind of literal historicism, let's say. And um, um, he was already off into some new territory. And the, the notion of all the kind of tenets of modernism and the main characters, Mies van der Rohe and Alto and, and of course, Corbusier, et cetera, were now um, less and less interesting. And of course, I was in LA, which had a really insanely rich um, world of modern architecture with the case study boys. And it's, um, we were rejecting that. So for me, they were completely uninteresting at the time. And again, I think when you're really young, you don't really understand it. Um, you just uh, kind of smell it, you sniff it, you intuit it. And it's like all young generations, whether it's anything in culture, whether it's music or et cetera, that they can kind of sense it. And we sensed that we were onto something, but didn't really get it. And it was years later that uh, this became the foundation of my work. And it's, it's going to turn into something that's much more connected to the biological organization at this point of time. And then um, at this point in my life, um, it becomes my goal as a teacher. And then I think of Ralph, and I've, um, I still keep in touch with him. And um, he's my model because I'm so lucky to have somebody as a teacher um, literally 50 years ago that I'm still working with his project. And I think that's a real gift um, to have somebody of that kind of character. Well, mm, I'm coming out of school, and I'm just basically um, asking questions where I'm, I'm teaching. I started, uh, I was one of, um, five people that we started a thing called the Southern California Institute of Architecture, SciArc, and at the same time, Morphosis with um, a partner, Jim Stafford. And um, I, um, hmm, I'm practicing more like I was a musician or a, a, an actor or something. No work. I'm just interested in the art form. We're drawing. We're, um, we're teaching. Um, 
Huh, that's also interesting. We're teaching, but we don't know what we're really teaching because I have no idea what I'm doing yet. So I'm really asking questions. And it's strange, again, I look back now as I'm a little lazier now as I use experience in my teaching. And I think I actually know more. And um, at that time, I was just asking questions, but the students somehow related to you because they understood that you were closer to them. You were asking the same things. And um, we, we start our first little buildings. And um, we immediately started asking questions of how we make them. And we're in Los Angeles. Well, like a lot of the US, the, 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 the building industry is, is fairly um, simplistic. And we weren't particularly happy with the, um, the nature of uh, the kind of found construction industry. And we wanted something a little more precise. And it included rethinking how we draw buildings. And instead of drawing them, we put it together like a model kit that came from our youth and then showed an instruction of how to put it together. And it's interesting because this became a model of how we work today in a computer, which I'll talk about. And then some of our first little projects, and so we get a house, and I'm, um, there's no particular focus. I'm looking at everybody. I had hugely influence from everybody from a Sterling to an Aldo Rossi um, to, of course, Archigram, where I took my name, uh, the collective practice. And, um, and then I'm looking at uh, the Lebius Woods I'd just become aware of. And, and we were getting interested in urban ideas, and this is a house, and instead of being a single building, it's three things put together, and it was, uh, I think we called it village clutter, and we were kind of moving into um, urbanism, and I had a little stretch out of school with Gruen Associates, and I was definitely interested in, in urban ideas and was finding its way into the work, and then with that, the connection to the ground in a kind of tenuous way, that we saw the building and the ground being something, but yet hadn't figured it out, and then little corner, um, we're drawing. And we're just, we're drawing and drawing. And Sterling was my model. I remember um, getting his first book and, and devouring it. And then I went right to London and looked at all the work. And then I came back and bought another book. And the first thing I noticed is all the drawings were different. And then I got a third book and a fourth book and a fifth book. And they kept having different drawings. I'm going, God, this guy's really crazy. Every, he just keeps drawing and drawing and kind of thinking it. And it, it just made sense to me. And I realized that drawing is the way we think. And so the drawing isn't drawing like, a, like a, an art object where it's not even a drawing in terms of just the, uh, a mechanical drawing to, to particularly the building, but it's a method of organizing your spatial organizational ideas in your brain. And it's the way we think, it's the way I think. And then, well, we went from touching postmodernism vernacular to um, I think I probably just came back from uh, the Aerospace Museum and had seen the, the uh, lunar lander and went, ah, let's go a different direction. And it's something more modern and different kind of materials that represent the, um, the 20th century. And then I'm, well, I'm kind of back connecting things again. And it's, it's, now it's kind of a piece of a, a, a more modern orthogonal piece that's, that's related to a, a vernacular piece. And it was a husband and wife that didn't get together. And one wanted it old and one wanted new. And we kind of played a game with it and put it together as an idea for the house. And, um, and then when it was done, um, I draw. And the drawings were done when the house was complete. And I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't know where to go with it. And I just draw it again. And it's somehow cathartic. I'm kind of working with it. And at the same time, um, I ended it looking at it, um, making it very didactic. I was aware that I'm looking at my own work. And I'm uncomfortable with it. And I'm trying to figure it out. And then we started modeling it. And we started modeling the interior instead of the exterior. Because it was really um, it was about a complexity of interior spaces. I think there were like 26 different levels. And it was about um, the beginning of an, of, of an interest in a, um, a complexity that um, only architecture exhibits, given its complexity and its relationship to its uses, um, understood socially and culturally, and its relationship to the site, et cetera. Um, and then 10 years went by. And I'm still just um, kind of wandering and thinking and, and looking and observing. And um, again, for the students here, um, I would think the most important characteristic you have, especially right out of school, right out of school, maybe in the next decade or so, is to be alert. You just keep your eyes open. You, um, you observe. You're constantly looking for information that um, unsticks you, that allows you to, 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 to find a course in terms of what architecture is. And again, I think, strangely enough, architecture at this point of time is also now kind of ended the, um, let's say, the post-digital age. We got informed by digital, and that kept us going for maybe 15, 15 years now, in allowing us radically different kind of forms, and it's also had a lot to do with construction, which I'll talk about. 
but I think we're again kind of looking at um, kind of where architecture is in, in a formal terms. Um, kind of what is the project of architecture seems to be a question today. And it's, um, as I look at various academic institutions, it seems like they're all starting to kind of ask this question. Well, I'm starting now in the 80s, and um, the computer just got a sniff. And this is a Mac book. I think it was like 250 megs. <laughs> you can believe that. Um, and PA was giving this to architects, and they gave one to our firm. And um, I'm not a tech person, and I'm an absolute uh, luddite with, with technology. And, um, uh, but I tried to work on it and make it into a drawing, because I'm drawing the old style. And um, it was about an organizational idea for a building that was going to become this. And it's a little house in Venice. And we were doing these little, again, projects, small houses, and this really lovely um, kind of neighborhoods in, in Venice, uh, kind of working class neighborhoods that were being taken over by artists, et cetera. And um, we're modeling, and the models are um, in some way part of our work. We understood them as autonomous. They in themselves we saw as art pieces. There were, there were them, the cells had qualities. And, um, and then we were getting very involved in the precision of making these things. They were all built for nothing. This is, I think, $80,000 or something. We built half of them. And um, we literally um, put them together and, and showed framers how to make them, et cetera. And then that continued and this notion of um, construction of making um, we were behaving more like sculptors and they were interested in forming something and being very very inextricably connected to its making versus just the drawing and we were also um, less and less interested in the commissions we have um, at this point of our life cafes um, retail stores had no interest whatsoever in the retail store or in the cafe as a as a like an economic enterprise. We were interested in architecture and promoting how does architecture um, connect to these, um, these places and um, how can we find and locate the culture of architecture. And a lot of it became these mm, specific um, interventions that occupied the, the larger space. And we were focusing on those and we were at the same time now expanding our constructional techniques and we're working with steel fabrication and casting, and we're trying to find um, through the materials a very different language of architecture, which moved away from the Southern California stick stucco construction that we had absolutely no interest in and kind of refused to do. And, um, and then we were working our first kind of larger commission, it was at the cancer clinic at the, in uh, Cedar Sinai. And um, again, this is going to happen to you. You've done a couple little houses. The largest thing we've done, this is that Lawrence house, the, the house of the two pieces, and uh, it was published in Germany, and the client saw it and hired me, and we, we got this job doing a medical, a really complex job. And this is a, um, a piece that kind of celebrates landscape, and because um, it's an underground location, and is a part of a theater for children, because the, the center of this facility was pediatric oncology. And again, we went to work on these kind of very specific pieces where we could put huge amount of energy and kind of talk about the um, hmm, kind of a specificity of that we could make something we, we couldn't quite do in the work yet. And again, um, this is the, now a shop for clothes, and we showed the loom. We kind of built a conceptual loom, and it became part of the, the display, et cetera. And you're looking up at the edge as we're making the mannequins, et cetera. And then with that came furniture and objects. And again, um, somebody did somebody just tell me that you're going to open up an industrial design school or you're thinking of it next year. Um, I've never been able to separate architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, furniture design, graphics. To me, they all use um, visual thinking and they operated very, very different scales and different kind of criterion. But um, I'm interested, I see a continuity in all of those things. So we're using our same notion of making as we start making furniture. And now this stuff goes right back to the architecture because it's kind of pushing us and we're allowed to invent stuff through casting that we couldn't possibly make or even think of designing if we didn't have an understanding of the casting process. And we were in the shop. And I started working very early with a, um, a metal shop in LA that we've now worked for for 30 years. And um, we're in the shop. Um, 
hands-on understanding the nature of these processes. And again, I think that's something that um, maybe someone will say something after the talk. Um, in most of this country, um, people don't make things anymore. And architects has become less and less engaged in the specificity of um, construction. And I think it's a huge problem in the industry and it keeps narrowing us. And, 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 and the opportunities are getting larger and larger in the other direction, which I'm gonna end with. And then um, the formal work, there's just accidents happening. We're working on a, another residence and we're building one of these pieces that seems to be the most intense, the, the most kind of rich in its qualities. And we're photographing it and we look at it and we go, wait a minute, um, this fragment is more interesting than the building up on the corner. And um, it, it got us thinking uh, in terms of formal ideas that was pushing us to let's kind of build things that are unfinished, that have kind of a future, but that are in process. And that again connects directly to construction. Probably like a lot of you, um, I love buildings at the 70, 80% completion. You just want to stop. They never get kind of stronger. They're really beautiful as they're in process. And, um, and that fragmentation was now becoming um, very much part of a formal language as we drew. And now we're easing into the computer. It's still very, very kind of primitive. Um, and um, these fragments all have their own autonomy. And it's very much connected to an idea that Smithson's engaged that goes back to my first project I shooted with, my, with Professor Knowles of independent forces producing architecture. It's not a single force, which is a, which is a classical model. It's a set of independent things. And it wasn't about deconstruction. We got caught up with another movement. It's actually about construction. I'm not interested in taking things apart. I'm interested in putting things together. But they're put together in a different way. And they're, they're incomplete. And they have um, these elements have their own autonomy. And these areas of intensification started showing up now in all the work and um, where we could um, differentiate the more vanilla, the plainer kind of aspect of the work in these areas that we invest in. And then this notion of fragment and differentiation became uh, kind of some way finalized or it, it took the next stage in the Sixth Street house. It was a house I was living in and um, we started working on this and at some point before this model, I realized that we were never going to build it, that the project was more interesting than the reality, meaning my house. And, um, uh, but it was about uh, now an idea where we made this thing up of a series of non sequitur things. And it was about association of these things and their mechanics. And it was about a building that no longer had um, a continuity of, of facades, but each facade was connected to its specificity of its environment. And it, again, it was taking us in a very, very different direction, and condensing that. And here we are now, and we're building houses that are uh, residences that are um, that have to do with these multiple forces that um, are left in a state of construction. And then, with that, of course, we're at the, simultaneous to this. We're we're moving forward on the ground building, and we hadn't articulated that yet. But all of them are very, very conscious of the relationship to landscape, water, etc as it engages in the building. And um, we're constantly looking at the, um, the alignment and the, 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 the connection, the penetration between landscape and building. And then, um, again, um, the students, um, what you're gonna find, I think, is that you're, um, I'm now, I've worked for uh, 15 years out of school, and we're, we're getting a consistency of these little projects and, and residences, et cetera. And um, we're working on competitions at the next scale that we couldn't possibly get in terms of commissions. And we're, uh, we were invited to the American Gedenk Bibliothek in Berlin, and this is our project. And now the urbanism is coming directly from a lot of the ideas I'm talking to you, but it's finding a, a resolution within a, um, a project type, in the scale type of the urbanism that makes sense, having to do with these multiple elements which are solving multiple issues of a very complex site. And, um, are now moving to a strategy that can deal with the complexity of the city that requires some notion of um, organization. And um, a competition for the Prada, we just got reinvited. Uh, what is this, 25 years later, we're gonna be at it again. It was won by Mineo, um, one for the, in Vienna. Um, we're starting to get on a, uh, hmm, 
people are starting to know us a bit, and we're getting invited now fairly consistently. This is a housing project in Vienna that uh, was invited by Coup uh, Pemplau, and um, the American Gedeck Bibliothek in um, in, in um, Frankfurt, which we took third place now, and uh, that was won by Coup Pemplau, and um, the interior, and we're. Um, getting closer to kind of this kind of scale of work, but we're, um, they're practice runs. We're now probably on our, could be 20th competition, and um, these are done in six, seven, eight weeks, and um, we're understanding how to think quickly and how to um, hmm, organize a fairly large teams in that period of time while you're keeping the rest of the office going. And it's extremely important that this takes place. This is kind of a, a huge learning process for your studio. And then again, uh, we were invited for the BMW competition, and we took third place in this one. And again, um, both of these were won by um, Coup Pimbablau in, in, um, in Vienna. And um, it ended up that our scheme and his scheme were incredibly close together. And, um, but we're, we're still tuning up. And what's going to happen is we're, um, a lot of these ideas are going to find their way in future work. And, um, which is going to allow us to um, work even quicker and get further along as we work on a competition framework. Okay, so we start the 90s. And um, at this point, it seems as though in formal terms, we're starting to have some noticeable continuity. And this notion of working with site, um, the relationship of multiple forces developing multiple formal elements, that, that form the work, um, the notion of the constructional process and material are all becoming um, somewhat consistent. And so that when we start with the, um, this residence in Santa Barbara, we start by marking the ground and we're moving more and more towards an architecture of landscape, although we still haven't totally kind of grasped it and are able to talk about it. And um, um, it's gonna be about a series of systems that mark the ground and it's, it's gonna be very much now connected to other influences coming in, and it's going to be um, the Smithsons, and it's going to be Heiser, and um, the Earth artists. And uh, I remember when I went to um, to see Double Negative, um, it was just mind blowing. It's it's a carve, it's a dig, and I'm an architect that builds and puts things on top of things and adds. And it had a huge, huge influence, and it's going to continue now through uh, really the rest of my career. And we're continuing doing competitions. This is the um, a theater for in, a, in an arts park. And now we're working collaboratively, and we're working with Kupima Blau. He's the one that puts the thing that carves right through the middle, of course. And um, that was fascinating, because it, it, I realized that I'm incredibly, we're very kind of organized thinking as we um, work through a project. And we keep challenging the project reiteratively. And as, it, as we, let's say, take it apart, or we look for opportunities, and he starts the other way. He starts with just a gash, and then makes it, um, uh, he rationalizes it in this process. We work exactly the opposite direction, and it was an incredible kind of learning experience to work with him in, this, in, the, in collaboration. And then he, in turn, invited us to a competition in Vienna, which is the Vienna Expo. And now we, we um, completely um, made a leap in this notion of landscape building, and the little pieces on the side are fragments of the site, and we put half the program in the site, and today that's easy. It's parking structure, transportation, theater centers, shopping centers, et cetera. And now the site and building are gonna be seen more and more singularly, and it's gonna um, take us through current work. And then um, we're, um, we got invited to do a project in Chiba, Japan, and it's the, the, the Chiba golf course um, that didn't get built in um, 91. Of course, everything went crazy. And now we, um, we're working with this idea of ground architecture, and uh, there's only one kind of piece above the ground that's a reference point, and it's about the holding of a site, the negotiation of a site, the expansion of that, and then right after that, we got our first large project, and um, at lunch today, we were discussing, or somebody asked me, was there a kind of point where there's some sort of marker in my career, and I said no, and then I thought about it some more, and, and this actually was a marker, and I remember walking through with Richard Weinstein, the, the, the dean at UCLA at the time, and as we walked through, he, he said, Tom, um, he knew I, I saw architecture as a political act. Another conversation later, I think, uh, to ask you guys, I find students in this country don't even see architecture as political, and it's only political. Um, anyway, he walked through and he said, Tom, finally you've, um, you've connected the, um, the aesthetic and the social act. 
which was true, and it was definitely a marker. Um, probably my first building of, of real essence. And I had this incredible client, the superintendent of schools, um, the little sketch on the computer, that's what I showed him. That's the first concept, and it's about the movement of Earth that makes the school, and we built this. And um, we're starting to ask questions now outside of design. And that when um, we were working on this, I remember John Enroy and I, the project architect and I, were talking to the district, and we wanted to ask, how does architecture participate with education? We're not starting with a style or just the notion of making a building. We want to know how does architecture, and of course it has huge possibilities, um, just in its aspiration. And that later, when this was, a school was occupied, um, it allowed, this is a high school, it allows um, 14, 18 year olds to scratch their head and say, this is architecture, and what does it mean? And um, it's something different we haven't seen before. <coughs> and whether it's about the specifics of uh, geometry or mathematics, where it's about the larger idea of, uh, of an, arch an architecture, which is uh, mimicking landscape, it's the um, kind of the largest exhibit that they have in terms of promoting their idea. And then right after that, we won a competition in, um, in Austria for a bank. Um, I guess a group of you are going to graduate in about a week, right? Um, I'm now, hmm, we're pushing 20 years out of school, undergraduate. And my first really serious job, and uh, everybody told me, that it'd be out of this country um, because I'm interested in kind of pushing a bit harder than this is a tough country to practice in. This is a, the most conservative country in Europe in the most conservative part of the country, the South, and it's a bank. And um, never once do we discuss aesthetics. That's my job. And it's again, I, I, this is the time I realized I was an American architect and I started differentiating myself as an American architect because all my European friends were doing this. And it was, um, they were seen as artists. And going back uh, to the first comment I, I said when I'm saying I'm taking you through this work and you're defining who you are, it became apparent to me and I was thinking on the plane here, well, I had a lot of time to think, it took me over a day to get here, um, uh, that coming, coming, coming here to Knoxville and Knoxville slack, slash um, Nashville, I was thinking of music. And it occurred to me that um, I think I've always, I, I, just from the beginning, I saw architecture as an art form. And again, I think I said it much more like a musician, that it was my job, I was an artist. I'm not a business person. I have no interest in business whatsoever other than that it has to work because I like to have money and I like to pay my rent. Um, uh, I'm an artist and it, it's, it's much different in this country. It's, it's, we aren't seen that way and it's, um, it hurts us because we, should, we shouldn't be similar. We offer a very different point of view and we live in a different world. Very few people think visually. And they, or, they, or they have dreams or they have desires that start with a visual world. This is the way you say with a musician. Um, a, a friend of mine just sent me the piece of, um, uh, I'm tired, who decide? Um, Yes, Prince. And uh, I, I just pulled it up and he was doing a, a, an honorary thing for the, the, the Hall of Fame for McCartney. Anybody seen that piece? He does a little last four minute riff. And oh, it just it makes your, hair, it makes your, your hair, hair stand up. It's just amazing. And he's this character that just, um, he's completely, totally connected to this guitar and how he plays. And he just goes away in another world. And it makes me think again, um, that's an art form. This is a person that his art takes over completely, where it's impossible to separate the human being from his music. And architecture has to have some of that left in it, that you have to be um, in love with your art. And um, nobody, I, 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 a lot of architects out here, no one would do architecture in love with it. It's the most ridiculous profession in the world. My wife's an MBA and she finds it just ludicrous. And, um, and definitely it would tell you that yes, um, you'd have to love it, of course, to stay in it. And, um, and we're drawing differently now. The computer is starting to integrate into the office and um, these little drawings, I couldn't draw them. And I'm realizing my days are numbered because I'm still drawing in a classical sense with a, um, an Eagle uh, 314 and uh, the only pencil I've ever used. And um, 
we're getting these, these, these shapes and I'm realizing um, we're gonna move in a different direction. And then we got hired by the same client at Udina to do another bank. And um, now landscape, car, infrastructure, building are coming more and more together. And we're doing these double landscapes where you make new landscapes, uh, artificial and real, and they allow you to, um, to, to control the building and to control movement, et cetera. And we're, we're pursuing this idea of landscape in a, in a further way. And then, uh, again, I was mentioning non sequiturs. These projects are just walking in the office. I have no control, right? We don't mark it. The, the phone rings or it doesn't ring. And um, this, 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 these people come over from Korea and they have a, a, little, a little office building he wants to build. And it's, it's kind of generic and we're trying to figure out what to do. And how does the architect participate? And it's pretty much just the skin. And it's a design group. Whoop. It's a design group. And um, so we're using Jim Dine's um, famous painting of the robe without the person, sans, sans human being. And we're gonna work on the, 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 the skin. And that's gonna be the project. And we're using origami. And now the computer is really helping us. We're doing things that we couldn't have done drawing as we do this thing three-dimensional. And we're organizing the origami and, um, and rationalizing it for construction. And we built this. And it's just a simple, simple little project where we're just focusing on one thing. But again, we're looking for differentiation, going way back to Mr. Knowles. Um, we're looking for making something that has um, a complexity. And you see it in different places in the city, it always looks different. And the computer, photo techniques, et cetera, are shifting the way we draw, which goes directly back into the, the real thing. Um, the qualities of those drawings now allow us for transparencies and translucencies. And we're still doing competitions. I'm showing this one because the little drawing up there with the egg, um, we're making this stuff by hand, and the forms are getting more compl complicated. This is a competition in Nara, in Japan. And it took us a week and a half to do the, that form, and we've got six weeks for the competition. Um, four years later, we're working on another competition, and we've got a computer, and now I'm still working on the elliptoid, and I can, in minutes, kind of reshape this thing. And there's this huge leap now, and there's going to be a shift that's taking place in the profession that expands our form making, which I'm sure all of you are, 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 are part of um, at this point in time. So we're doing a theater, and I want to absorb the fly and have one continuous form. And I'm able to slump this form now and change it instantaneously in a way that I could have never done. So the model you're looking at now is done in, in four days versus four weeks. And I've now got technology. We were the first people to get a Form Z. And um, while I sleep, while everybody sleeps, the model's being made. You know, and, and we wake up in the morning, and here it is. And it's incredibly integrated. It, it's, it's, it, it, it incorporates an enormous amount of information, which includes structural engineering and MEP, and of course all the kind of functional kind of aspects. And I can look at it now as a, um, a drawing, we wouldn't even call this. I can put it in the site and look at it as a kind of a part of a site gesture, et cetera. And then with that, um, the computer is now becoming extremely kind of part of our focus, and we're developing ideas that come, this is an exhibit that was in Copenhagen, but um, we're now able to draw things that I couldn't possibly draw. And it's now over. There's not a pencil in the office except for me who uses it as notation. And we can draw sections at the speed of light, et cetera, and look at it through CAT scans now more than sections. And this took place, and it was huge. Um, never could do this before. We can crawl in the work and move around and look at it perceptually versus conceptually. And this, again, was a marker where from now on we have these kind of abilities to work in a way that we could have never possibly worked without these tools. And then that system of organization, the multiple forms, is um, developing ideas of how we order complex spaces. This is a, a um, design space in Taipei, and we're trying to give something that's complete incoherent coherence, and we're doing it with these four systems. And again, that's, that's me just kind of quickly sketching over and just trying to, um, hmm, drawing is still extreme expedient and kind of quick, um, and it, but they're just notations as I'm talking to my, my people. And um, here it is, as it becomes a plan. And again, we had a different model maker at this time. We were using a, a resin machine. And again, now we can look at it conceptually with these various systems and how they interact, and we can build it, and it's becoming more and more singular from early design through construction. And then we're invited um, through somebody that saw that actually to a show in, um, in Rotterdam. And uh, we're making an installation 
and we're using the dynamics, it's moving, et cetera. We're, we're using a lot of this in terms of ideas. And then one thing leads to the next. Um, the Shelleroy Dance Company saw that and invited us to open the, 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 um, the Venice Biennale, the Art Biennale, and we opened. And we used this idea of a moving, a moving set, moving architecture, moving place with moving dancers. So they speak to each other. And then we're um, coming to the close of the 90s, and we're starting to get a consistency of larger work. This is the first project. It's a, it's a, it's a million point two square foot. It's the um, Caltrans. It's the head of, uh, of transportation in Los Angeles. Um, and it was this really complicated project. It was 30 months design build. We were in a partnership. Um, and it was for an incredibly tight budget. And um, we have the tools to do this now. We're, um, the, the, there's a, a parallel track on the computer that has to do with construction that we were very early on. That it, it became clear to me that with the computer, you wanted to do every aspect of the building. It was in, an integrative tool, and um, it allowed us to produce this thing in just rapid time. And it was our first kind of large-scale urban piece. And um, it was the first time we did the working drawings, and it allowed us to change the office. Before this, we were having to use joint ventures and all that kind of thing. Um, the public space at night. And again, the whole idea was to activate LA with, with public space, um, a city that's not quite there yet, or it's moving in that direction as we speak. And um, a facade that was seen as a, a blotter, a screen, a receiver, in this case for um, evening events of, of film, et cetera. And the facade, which was uh, infrastructural, it was, the, um, it was the symbol of people that build infrastructure and we use people as part of the building material. And then again, um, you get opportunities, and they're, they're these very non sequitur events, because these are happening one after the other, or, or simultaneously, and we're, we're invited to do a project in Spain for low-cost housing, for social housing, which would be not existing in this country. You couldn't do it. And we went to work, and again, we just start thinking about how does an architect relate to this project, and they build in um, building blocks, and they're very institutionalized. And um, we decided it needed to be taken apart and given the scale, outdoor space, and it had to have residential quality that wasn't part of the block. And um, we ended up with this. We made communities, an open space and, and um, a collective open space, communal open space, as well as plazas. We're starting this century, and it's going to ramp up now, and I'm going to be able to go a little quicker because you're going to see that um, there's going to be a consistency of these ideas and methods and processes as they start ramping up. So we're doing the GSA building in San Francisco, and this is an early schematic model. And we're now in schematic, and we can talk about it at this level of specificity, and we have the tools now to produce a huge amount of information. And I think what's changed, and again, um, for the young people out there, um, what they call big data, um, Today, what's happening is there's, um, the, the amount of information showing up very early on in a project is increasing, and, and you can include that in your early idea. And it's completely necessary to deal with the, the increase in complexity of um, the programmatic information as well as constructional and the economic um, viability of the building. And we um, ask a series of questions early on about uh, environment, workplace, open space, and that ended up with this building. And um, this now represents another marker in that um, once we won this project, there were all kinds of articles out in the San Francisco papers that were um, disparaging us. A bad boy Tom Main, a radical office morphosis is coming up to ruin our city, blah, blah, blah. And when we sat down, uh, we, we, it was the first time we really thought strategically and we were gonna only talk about um, uh, open space, workspace, environment, and environment, and never talk about aesthetics, knowing that we'd be in alignment with the city on those three issues. And we went to work and, and completely changed the, the lower space instead of being a, a lobby as a, a children's center that came out of a study that 55% th uh, of the people there were, that worked there were women. Uh, a good ch portion of them had children and they could visit their kids during work. We put a, an open space in the top that you're looking at. Um, San Francisco is famous for its best pocket parks. People get married there. You're looking at their views as you look out over the city. But it still has this multiple system. It still has what we're trying to bring in, a kind of a personality that has to do with the idiosyncratic. I haven't used that word yet. 
but everything I was interested in had to do with idiosyncrasy, with the um, imperfection um, versus perfection, and um, the relationship of things which have an order, but a much more complex order that's parallel to, to what we now look at as in terms of biology. And then every once in a while I show a slide, that's how I see it. I can't show that to clients. That's, um, you pick out your own images that are important to you. And for me, they go back to paintings or they go back to a more abstract idea. And then we gave it a, um, a public space. It, it's the major federal building in the city. And we gave it a very, very prominent space. It faces the seventh court of appeals, which is the, the infamous court in San Francisco. And it needed a, um, a solidity, an importance, a gravitas. And uh, out of that was the concrete. And again, um, everything I'm showing you are very, very inexpensive buildings. They're not even middle. They're the bottom of the spectrum. So everything's kind of very raw, concrete, structural concrete, not architectural concrete. And now we're, we keep working on our methodologies, and we're working with Permasilisa on, um, on the skin, and we now have uh, the techniques to do that. And we're asking questions early on that are not about aesthetics. They're about performance. And again, this is a building that's going to start shifting us into performance. And uh, we built the first tall building in the United States, and we took out the air conditioning. And the, um, it shows you on that little chart what it does. And the, the effect of this is 600 houses. One building can totally power 600 houses. And the facades, uh, south and north and south, came out of this. And it's um, about performance. And then. Um, Right at si simultaneous to this, we, we, um, we got a commission at Cincinnati and, uh, to build a very, very large complex, the largest building on the, on the campus, which is um, housing and academic space and the main sports facility and the main food facility as well as infrastructure. And it's a, um, not really a building. It's a, it's a, it's a, a group of an urban ensemble, let's say. And, um, and with the, the technology that's driving construction, is the, com the computer is, is now developing our ability to develop more and more complex interactions and develop um, ideas that we couldn't possibly even think about um, when we're working by, with, with, with the pencil with, on drafting boards. And, and, but what's happening now also, we're working micro macro. We can work with elements of pieces and put them in the larger framework of, um, in this case, a structural system that's interacting with a roof system, that's interacting with a column system, that's making up the gymnasium, and make these connections and take them through a constructional process. Um, and it, we're able to build more and more kind of complicated things, and we, we're able to understand them both in organizational terms, in terms of a design idea, and in their flow into construction and into reality. And what I'm interested in, and we're moving more and more in that direction, is an architecture that has the complexity of a city, um, this city, over time, um, and the kind of accidents that take place. When I walk through town, um, I find the things that are most interesting are the collisions, the things that happen accidentally, and not the, necessarily the purposeful ones, and that um, give a city its richness over time with many, many architects and many planners and many people thinking out of city that take place over 100 or 200 years. And I'm interested in that kind of complexity that it feels like there's a series of events that took place and they're not so um, obvious in their ordering mechanism, but they're clearly coherent. And then we got probably the strangest project they could ever imagine given our reputation at the time. We won a courthouse um, with, um, in, in, in Oregon with Chief Justice uh, Judge Hogan. And I could, this could be an hour conversation. He took me to the, to the Supreme Court and as if I'd never seen it and um, showed me Cass Gilbert's building and he wanted that, believe it or not. And I said, well, I'm sorry to judge, but I can't deliver that one. And um, I took him to, to, to Paris and I showed him a Nouvelle and I showed him Richard Rogers and um, re-educated him what architects do. He thought I was gonna be his draftsman and he got to choose the building. And I said, uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. You get to do the program and all that stuff. I get to do the architecture and we built this. And, um, but it took us a year and about 150 schemes to get there. And um, I threw a rationale and I used fishing. He was an avid fisherman, so I used the Tao of fishing to start talking about a logic of connection. And then I took him through this, this exercise of an exterior 
that wraps. And again, I can, I can operate now in a way I couldn't, I couldn't operate before. And this is going to be very clear at the very end. And originally, it was going to have the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights kind of inscribed in the building. And, and the community was going to put each letter up. So they had ownership of the building. And we couldn't get that to work. And, um, and we, we built this. And uh, it's on a, a piano noble. It has a stair the size of the, the Supreme Court. Uh, it has a huge amount of information that comes from history, but it's translated into uh, a contemporary architecture. And the interior is dynamic and open-ended. And this was fascinating because the conversation was much less about architecture than it was about two very different interpretations of the Constitution. His being um, the literal, the fixed Constitution, mine being the open, and we went at it for a year. And um, for me, this thing had to be kind of open-ended. And it, it's, it's, this is where it's inextricable. You cannot separate. Um, architecture and, 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 um, and politics. And we built this. And again, the stair, the piano noble, in this case, a double. And then the courtroom. And the courtroom I could spend an hour with. It is absolutely connected to the, um, the classic one room courthouse, um, the, the location of the jury, the, the, the holding of the room. And now we've kind of added some pieces. Our trip to Paris, um, we saw a, a really interesting building by Nouvelle. And, 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 He's allowed to play in a way that it'd be hard to play here. And it was a very aggressive building in terms of his own attitude towards architecture. And the, the, the light was seen as the guillotine. We joked about it. And it comes right over him, and it separates prosecution and defense. And uh, it's filled with anecdotes and stories that came from our own dialogues over two years, the judge and I. And then we were invited to a show in Papadou. And um, we decided to leave the room empty and put everything on the floor. Um, as it reflects the roof, because it's um, a building that had huge influence on me. And I don't know about you guys, but I got out of school. I'd never been to Europe. And I immediately just started traveling every summer. And, um, and I, was, I had the luck of, of knowing a young person working on this team. And I went every summer to Pompidou as it was built. And it just had a profound effect on me. And um, when we did the, the show here, I wanted to mimic the roof, which everybody hates, of course. And it was really great, because um, um, Madame Pompidou, um, I showed up and um, looked at the show and looked at me and immediately um, smiled and said, oh, uh, you get it. Two things. Um, you reflect the ceiling that everybody hates, and you've got your clients on their knees. <laughs> it was fabulous. She was, she has a great sense of humor. She was a 90-year-old woman that looked, she dresses like she's 19, and she was just fabulous. And then we went a competition in Paris. And again, I'm going to kind of stream through. I'm getting, eh, I took a little time. Um, and now, the being interested in, this, in sp the specifics is really helping us. Because uh, there were 10 people here. And this was a great competition. It was, for me, it was a World Series. Literally, everybody was involved in it. Rem Koolhaas and, and uh, Herzog and, 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 and all the French guys, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I remember getting calls from friends of mine going, ah, oh, this is yours. You've got to have a good shot at this. Because the site was so specific that you could put nothing generic. You really, really had to study this non-site. And it's the, the, the orange is the site. And the, the box is a hole that has to be cut out of it. Um, that's a, a path for the, um, uh, the connection to the, uh, uh, the University of Côte And um, we um, came up with this incredibly complicated program. Uh, on this non-site that is, it, it, it's in um, uh, Letifons uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the, the one line next to the, 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 um, the, the station. And um, the model, or one of the models in the office, and then this project next to the second arch, the last arch. Whoop. And again, going back to Korea, looking at something that's varied. So as you see it from different parts of the city, you completely see different things. It reconstructs itself. And it's not really a building. It's a series of four things that come together. Ah, I'm in, I'm in Louis Vuitton I, um, six months ago. And I'm shooting out of the upper deck of Frank's building, looking at our, uh, the, the rendering of our building, in, in, as it would be in La Defense. And then um, it was um, the Far Tower was the second place winner for Eiffel Tower. Far is light. And um, th th we could be no taller than the Eiffel Tower, so it was just a couple centimeters shorter than 300 meters. And, um, but we interiorized the Eiffel Tower as an idea for the lobby. And um, if it would be built, it would have a 22-story lobby. And then, again, we're coming directly from San Francisco. 
and we're making it performance. And now it's bending with the sun, so it's, it's, it's uh, east, east southwest. And, um, and it's using a huge amount of the same kind of uh, technology we learned from in San Francisco in terms of developing the structure, incredibly complicated, the screen. And now we're, um, we're scripting. And we can take every element. There's 5,000 individual pieces of the screen. And the, the date on that will tell you when it's operating at its maximum efficiency. And I've got somebody, um, actually a team of three people, that are working for a year and a half just on the skin. And we're rationalizing in terms of construction into components. And we're midway through here, so we'll get it down to probably 15 or 16 different elements before we're done. And again, um, macro, micro, and schematic. This is one of the more complex wall sections that we can develop this. And we have to develop this to be able to go forward with the project to prove that we're actually on a cost model, that there'd be no reason to go to the next stage whether we um, whether we couldn't meet that cost model. And to do that, we have to be at this level. And today, it's actually common practice. This is what you're going to be doing. You're going to have a huge amount of constructional information at these early stages. And it expands what architects do in a way that's extremely useful. And we're building early prototypes. This is the first prototype. Not th there'll be a much more specific one. And then we're just looking at how one sees through it in terms of leasability and all kinds of pragmatic stuff having to do with the economics. And then we're looking at studies for lighting. And the lighting was going to be a kind of a conceptual sketch as if the lights represented kind of the nature of how this thing came about. Because working in Paris, unlike the San Francisco building, um, we wanted something that was very sensual and very much part of the Parisian kind of idea. And then we're at Caltech and we're taking a thing apart and it's actually about breaking a large building into components from the interior and getting rid of hallways and making them much more specific. We're working with astrophysicists who um, see themselves with a kind of high amount of identity and an, um, the institutional environment was not working for them. And then kind of a main space. And again, my sketches, which are um, just ideograms, they're not literal. And then again, using um, digital environment, we can now kind of intersect things and we're making um, something we couldn't possibly even imagine. This is that connector space, and it came from something that's hybridizing a cloud chamber and a notion of um, particle physics that came from our conversations with, um, there were six Nobel people in this, in this, in this uh, collective. And then we're in, um, simultaneously, we're in New York, and we're working on the, the Cooper Union. And again, you're going to see, um, the energy is, is put on the street, very, very inexpensive building. Um, and again, we're in kind of a line now with the client. Cooper Union um, was one of the foundation points of SciArc. We were looking at AA and Cooper Union as the institutions that we really admired. And uh, when I got this job, it was kind of a perfect, well, we, we might have got it also because they saw us as being interested in, in kind of the oddness of things again, the mistakes and the errors and the idiosyncratic. And uh, it was a building that wanted to be that and um, as part of their own mission. And again now, um, we're locating the architecture and the most interesting part of the building was the connection of engineering, architecture, and art, which is their claim to fame, and it, in, in a small block. And the connected tissue, which is the piazza, is a vertical piazza. And we're developing those ideas and drawing those ideas as we present to the client, and we end up with this. And um, it, you're going you're to get off on two floors. We're going to use Skip Stop, which came from Corbusier, which we used in San Francisco. And again, um, we can construct this now. Because as you develop more and more complex things, you have to take the responsibility for, for their manufacture. And the rule in our office, if you invent something, you've got to be able to make it. Don't expect anybody else to solve our problems. So you're seeing in the steel, um, Natalia Traverso, uh, I had a person that spent um, a year on the job uh, helping these guys build this thing. And it's this connective tissue. And um, it's a huge idiosyncratic. So every time you look around, again, like being in a village, you get a different view and a different notion. And here it is as it touches the street and uh, begins the stair, which is the social structure of the building. This area, like the Met or like the New York Library, is a, is a connective space. It's a social space. And then there's going to be a shift. Um, campus in um, Pudong, Shanghai. And I'm going to now, there's a bit, well, it might look like a non sequitur. Um, the same time all this happening, 
um, I'm drawing, conceptualizing, and um, the drawings are now, are, well, they're models or sculptures and drawings, and they're derived from a computer, but they have a lot of the same thinking as the, the hand drawings, and I'm interested in systems, and I'm looking at, again, um, accommodatory behavior between, these are all made out of exact four elements. So they have the same DNA, and I'm looking at the differences I can get out of these, and they're becoming ideas that would very much connect to um, the organization of architecture. So as um, I look at a conceptual plan that's coming from these drawings, um, you're looking at it, and it's going to turn into a broad organization for a little town, a campus, and I'm going to now rationalize that in terms of its systems as it becomes more architectural. And these associations are very loose, so it's incredibly flexible in terms of programmatic change. You can come in and continually change this, and I'm comfortable with it. I can just keep moving it around. And so it's very much in alignment with what, how clients work today and how program becomes so um, dynamic. It's changing constantly. And um, I can connect these systems together, and then those directly connect to plans. This is, a, um, is about 400 meters long, uh, across as a boulevard. It's a research center, and again, it's going to be all about ground. Manipulated landscape. This is the one we took the furthest. And those drawings are now modeled. Um, they turn into structural models. Again, we're now taking responsibility for organizing the structure as we work with uh, Bureau Happel in this case. And um, the construction of these various elements as they, um, as they increase in complexity that we, um, we're in control both of their invention in terms of the, their formal invention and in terms of their, their construction. And then the piece of work where everything you're seeing is building, both landscape and, and the line are all occupiable space. And we're pushing this notion of landscape and we're trying to integrate farm and city and um, find a hybridized model of these two, which I'm continuing on right as we speak. And of course, with landscape, you get this very dynamic set of possibilities that has to do with change that you can't get with a building. And then the organization, again, comes out of the connection of these various things. There's no composition. Nobody's drawing a facade. It's a result of these connective things as a strategy. And then a piece that you could never, ever get in this building, um, that's a conceptual piece that crosses the street, and it has a bridge that literally connects it. And I remember when I'm, um, we were presenting this for some American client, and he asked me what it did. And I said it, um, it connected the project from um, east to west. And they said, well, what's in it? And I said, nothing. And he said, what does it do? I said, it connects the project from east to west. Um, not even a question with this client. I get to do this stuff. And it's within reason. The project's on budget. It does everything it wants it to do. And you have to have this flexibility. Otherwise, architecture disappears. It has nothing to do with function. The culture of architecture has to do with the nature of how it operates as an idea. And the function comes with it, of course. That's, that's not even talked about. But it's, it's the broad idea. And the strange thing is a lot of people get this. The public gets it, really, because they find it really intriguing and interesting, maybe precisely because they don't see very much of it. And this system now makes spaces and it's urban, et cetera. And it's, um, it's about, a, a, again, making a campus, a small town, a building and landscape and an urban environment that all come together. And it's filled with accidents and interstitial spaces and movement that leaves the building and comes out of the landscape that moves through the landscape itself, which is bending, which is um, housing, gymnasiums, and um, recreational centers. These pieces which become pieces of lights, mechanical structure, an entry to the, to the hotel, the boardroom, which is the piece floating over the, the lake with the last floor, you're over the water, everything's about the connection of landscape and building, the tea room. And again, no two spaces are alike. Everything in the building is differentiated like a walk through a forest. And um, again, this kind of interest in, the, in a, a complexity of the city that you'd find. All made out of the same system of four pieces. And now there's going to be a shift. I am started um, the NOW Institute at UCLA, and I'm working on urban projects. And it's going to shift the office, and it's going to become more and more strategical and more and more about policy in terms of urban planning. And I just showed this to say that this kind of 
leaps in, it's a different subject, and it, it, it had to do with our urban work, and the urban work is now going to have more and more effect on our architecture. And now I've already been here for just about an hour. I'm going to just, the result of this, this is the current work, um, should be obvious that everything I showed you would lead up to what I'm going to show you now. So we're in Dallas, and we have to construct the site, and we start with um, an abstract idea of site as an idea, landscape. And um, it's going to become three-dimensional, and it's going to bend, and it's going to become, we're going to construct the site. It's a non-site next to the freeway. It's absolutely meaningless. And then I'm kind of quickly going over it and just talking about it, what it is. And then it's going to not take that long to actually turn it into a plan. It's very pragmatic, because by making the site larger, we can put everything on the first floor that wants to be there. We can give it more space on two levels in this case. And we're working in the same method reiteratively with um, literally hundreds and hundreds of models. And um, very early on, it's 3D, and we can talk about it in mechanical terms, in structural terms, in functional terms, as well as the organizing a beginning idea of the facade. And um, we get this. And uh, the courtyard and the movement, and the movement, again, didactic. And instead of going in the building, you're, you're leaving the building and moving towards the city. Um, here it is looking out. We're trying to make a connection to the city in this kind of funny site, and we're going to have this long experience as you go from the, the ground floor up. Um, fragments of lyrical landscape. Um, this vertical space, it's a couple hundred feet high. That's going to be the main organizing space of the, of the, of the uh, exhibits. The escalator. So when you get to the top, it's very much Guggenheim. You go to the top and walk down. Um, and you're connected to the city, and it's the best we could do is make a visual connection that we're, we're not in um, hmm, this kind of unfortunate site condition. It's a, it's, a, it's a facility that belongs in the city, and that's another kind of long conversation. Whoop. And then it's about, um, it's about youth, and um, we're always looking for opportunities. In this case, we stacked up the three elevators, made them all glazing, and it'd be like pulling a slot machine, depending on the condition. Um, you're not aware of it until it moves. And then the, the whole thing becomes evident that the, the dynamics of this. And um, that would be maybe a whole other talk. Buildings need a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, we're so serious as architects. And they're working on the skin. And we're going to make geology. We're going to build the geological thing. And here we are now. And we're getting more aggressive. We're in the shop. We're prototyping in our office. We're bringing things out here. Uh, Blue with the white hat is Carenza. She's showing these guys how to do this thing. We're in the shop. This is Gates, um, Gates Concrete, largest concrete in the United States. And um, we're making these pieces of the facade. We're involved in how they get constructed, how they get made. And they get fairly complex sometimes. And um, again, a marker. Um, an advertisement, an architectural record, and Holtzum now bought Gates. Um, this was six months before the building opened. They're advertising and selling our product. And um, my wife, who's an MBA, joked with me when I came up for dinner and showed her this. She said, Tom, you have a royalty on this, of course. And she knew the answer, of course, was no. And um, um, this is, for you guys, this generation, this is where we have to go. If you look at Ian Musk, if you look at Gates, if you look at the, the, the modern world today, um, you have to get invested in um, the complete project. And, and the economics of the project is, is in, the design is just this little teeny piece of it. It's the construction and it's the materials, et cetera. And it's absolutely one of the futures of our profession um, as we become more and more proficient and with, with the tools that we have that allow us to do this. And um, you're going to see San Francisco Museum of Modern Art opening in a couple days. It's got the skin on it. And then we're at, um, Emerson in Los Angeles, still drawing. Um, this came out of a recent book we're doing. And I did it for you, you the students, because I think it's important you still understand the importance of drawing and the, the littleness of drawing uh, in terms of thinking. And uh, we built this. And it's housing on the edges, academic in the middle. Um, and it was just um, pretty straightforward. It's on Sunset Boulevard, um, kind of really typical, super typical Los Angeles site. Very typical Los Angeles uh, photograph, I would say. I guess it could be Miami. And um, an urban building, they're a Boston institution, and we built all this interstitial space. The Hollywood sign, perfect, perfect location. 
in terms of its representation of Los Angeles and all these kind of spaces in between. And we're literally building kind of the accidents, the alleyways, the, the, the spaces that you find in an urbanized environment and bringing Boston to Los Angeles in that sense. And then here it is again, we have the tools. And the, 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 the um, more organic pieces um, we can construct, and they're, this is simple today, um, they're absolutely kind of doable. And now we're in the shop with Zaner, and um, we're coming up with means of making this thing that are the most economical, and they're more like an airplane than a, than a traditional building. And we could do this. And then on the skin, same thing. Um, working with Zaner again, I've got somebody scripting, working on these pieces, and we, um, we can take a, a four by eight piece of um, aluminum sheet, and we can use every bit of it and work on the shape language and um, invent this kind of skin that's made out of um, a, a large number of differentiated parts and then map it. So this went to the contractor and it shows him where to put each one of those elements on the wall. And we're absolutely connected to the construction of this thing. And um, Clant loves it and Zaner loves it because we help solve his problem, which is now our problem, meaning us and Zaner working together in a partnership. And then finally, um, uh, literally this taking place right now, we have a very, very big building in Shenzhen. It's a 350 meter tower. And um, mm, there it is, about four months ago, coming out of the ground. And it's a um, uh, kind of an unusual building and that we remoted the lift. It'll show up right there. The lifts are remoted from the building and you cross uh, um, 40 foot glass bridges. So as you go to, the, oh, I put that in LA, how to just built the tallest building. And the lower part is commercial and we kind of open it up and touch the ground again. Um, entry to commercial, entry to office, looking out one of those bridges uh, from the 80th floor, looking over the city. So as you go to work every day, you're crossing one of these bridges and you're gonna look up and see 80 of these things crossing each other and you could be see people moving back and forth in kind of this intense activity. Um, morning and evening as you connect to the city and then um, a building that was just finished and again you're looking at now the models are getting kind of more sophisticated more detailed where we're just about building the building in the model um, at the end of DD in this case and um, we get this this is the, the Gates Technology School and Cornell Oh, little things creep in once in a while. We took them. I haven't done a restaurant for many years. Um, this is Clyde's in New York. But now we don't even see this architecture. It's installation. We literally treated it like it was a, a museum installation because restaurants today are good for four or five years and they move on and it became a really interesting idea. And then the last project I'm going to end with is a, um, one of the most interesting projects I think we've ever, ever gotten. It's a, um, we were in a competition with 10 people in, um, in Vals, and Vals is where Zumtor has his bath, if you know the Therm, um, very, very famous building, uh, 150 kilometers uh, south of Zurich in a uh, little village of 850 people, and they had a competition to put it, produce a hotel in this little town, and um, we've been talking recently about um, kind of an attitude towards the kind of compromises we make, uh, even in competitions, in terms of trying to get the work. And recently, we were taking a different tack in the office, and we decided uh, we're gonna only do what we want to do. And we're gonna stop, we're gonna do things that we really believe in, and we're gonna kind of reverse that kind of notion. And it was really weird, but the first three or four projects we did using this, and, um, and they're, they're all a bit outrageous. Uh, we, won, we won one and just missed winning the other. And we're going, wait a minute, this is actually a better, better, a better strategy of going after it. And we, we, we produced a tower, and it's a 400-meter tower in this valley. It's the tallest building in Europe. It'll have um, sometimes four floors, four rooms, sometimes two, sometimes one room at a floor. And um, it's this amazing little line. And now we're looking at people like um, uh, um, Irwin, Etc. in terms of art, it'll be this one crystalline kind of piece. And we knew we were gonna get huge, um, we were get a response from the Swiss and from the community that'd be very negative about building a huge tower 
um, in this little tiny town. And um, uh, we built very purposely, and again, I showed you the urban work, and then it's been happening with our larger architecture. More and more, we're, we think strategically, and you're thinking about making an argument, not about the aesthetic. You're talking about making an argument. So we, when we presented this in New York, when the opening came, we built this model of the site and put the piece in it, and all the press that came there were prepared to attack us on this enormous scale. And in a city, yes, it's a very big building. In fact, they said it's a, a tower, and I said, no, it's not a tower. <coughs> and they looked at me incredulously, it's just 400 meters. And I said, you have to understand, it's a piece of sculpture in this, in this valley. And we made this model, and it was absolutely fascinating. We just took the rug right off from under them, because they all wanted to write and photograph it and say it's this huge tower, and they had to use this photograph to do it. And it's um, really, really important, because I think we've been, um, I've been especially, so focused on aesthetics and my work that I think today the world has changed a lot and one has to engage in the world. And if you want to do something that you think you believe in, you have to find ways of, of uh, approaching that problem in ways people understand. And then the last slide is the fun one. Um, this was one of the strangest briefs I ever got in that um, in the brief, um, as part of the, the conversation of numbers of rooms and the site and all that, it, it, there was a statement that, that um, this is a place where he wanted people to have really great sex. <laughs> and Brandon and, and Arnie and E, my three head guys, and I sat around going, you know, we never got a brief. That, that, that was a new one for us. And, but it, it took us another place. And they were going, this is not a project. This is not a housing project. This is not about an architectonic project. This is a project about kind of a mood. And this is where people go to get away. And in our presentation, this was our last image. And I was told later that it, we won the competition. And that it, it wasn't just the building. He understood by this image that we understood the problem, what he was trying to do. With that, I will end it. Thank you so much. I was told, uh, I, I, I'm totally aware, by the way, that that was a very odd ending. <laughs> Just, uh, I was told people ask questions. If you'd like to ask, I would be more than happy to respond. Uh, contractors, means and methods. Um, no, all the pieces that are complex, like say the uh, Cooper Union, the piece, um, we we construct it, show them how to make. Well, not show them. How, we get far enough along, we work together, and now we we collaborate. And um, it's funny. I, I I come from Gary, Indiana. I come from Gary, Indiana, and my family comes from Tipton, Indiana, a little farming town. And I'm also in the era where we just made stuff since I was a kid. And I, I went through a period of my life where I was um, building cars and racing cars. And I'm, I'm interested in mechanics. And um, I think a lot of the current generation, I'm not sure what it's like here, you have to tell me. I know my boys are computer people. They, they never open the hood of a car. Um, but I've made stuff. In architecture, that's what we do. We make stuff. And, and, um, but it seems like the profession starting quite a while ago, late 70s, 80s, as it was being taken over by lawyers, um, they, they stopped taking responsibility, huge mistake. Um, I have to say, I, I think one of the problems with our profession is that we're kind of risk adverse. No risk, no reward. Simple as that, not complicated, anybody will tell you that. And um, uh, 
And today, the, the weird thing is, with the tools we have, we're taking much less risk. I'm in a fight with errors and emissions right now, and I want them to have my fee. It's, I'm, they're ripping me off because I'm giving them absolutely um, documents that they didn't even, couldn't have existed 10 years ago, and I'm reducing risk. And um, I'm not taking risk. I'm, I'm actually, myself, taking responsibility. And it also gives you, um, I think, an advantage of working with contractors that are going to work with you. They're going to help you. And most of the work I'm showing you was still very tight, taut budgets. I mean, we really, really had to push. Like the skin on the Emerson building, we were wasting 20% of the, as we were cutting the, uh, the sheets of aluminum. As we came back and working with Zaner and our group, we made a, a pattern that used 100% because I needed that 20% on the building that I was throwing away because I didn't have any more money. I had X amount of sheets to use. And, and so there's an absolute connection between what you're desiring in the building and construction. And um, it's also expanding the field in a way that's, um, for the young people out there, it's essential. Um, I think we've, and this is somebody from a, as a, seen as a designer and a formalist, I guess. Um, there's so much overemphasis put on design in our schools. It's really a shame. Design is just one aspect of a building. And at some point, it comes, it, 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 it comes for nothing. You don't have to worry about it. You, you get involved, and it's just it's there. And uh, all the territories in an office, there's so many things to do that have nothing to do with design. I'm thinking of the right the design as we think about the, the, the initial kind of idea. And um, I, can't, I can't imagine that architecture is not going to grow within the constructional area. Who else can do it? I mean, the joke in our office, if we can't do it, why would anybody else be able to do it? We're the ones that have kind of come up with the idea, right? It'd be as if, if, if Elon Musk had an idea of the Tesla and went out and said, could you figure this out for me? Absurd. I have a Tesla. He reinvented a car, one guy. He came out of B school. He came out of Wharton in, in Pennsylvania. I think he has a degree in chemistry or mathematics or something. Not one industry could have done it. He, as a single person, just decided I'm going to do it, and he did it. And it's, um, I left a, a, a BMW, a, a five BMW, a race car, a really good car. It, not even close. This is a car that reinvented everything. And um, we need to be more thinking in that, in those terms. And um, he wouldn't be worth $27 billion if he didn't take a risk. It's all in the same deal. And um, I don't know. I, you, tell, you tell me. We have a kind of a wimpy profession at that level for me. And it's, um, I think it's nothing but good news for the, for the profession. And it's going to get stronger and stronger. Next. <laughs> If, if some of the things I'm saying are useful, I'm, I'm looking at your students. Um, you start off with little projects, and you're young, and you can only get your arms around so much. So in a way, um, even if you think you want more, you're OK with the house and the, the cafe and the little projects. And you do that for five, six, seven years. And then it gets a little more complicated, and you get your arms around something bigger. And then the projects become small schools or something, and you keep growing, and you're, you're now probably close to 40. And then there's another leap in the kind of larger scale projects, and definitely the urban projects, where there was a point now where um, it became evident that I was not just a designer. I was really, and, and I had somebody come in and help me, a, a management guru, um, that I was, much, I was moving towards thought leadership. Because it wasn't just design. He said, Tom, the projects are much bigger than the design. If you're a designer, you're going to keep yourself in a, in a little box, and the bigger, the bigger one is in the bigger box if you want to have more control. And the projects are now more political, uh, and the, the economics, the funding, et cetera, that you really have to, again, be more kind of Tesla-like. And it, he doesn't think, in fact, the design of the Tesla is actually, it's okay, it's kind of clean, but it's not, a, it's not a spectacularly design car. It's not what it's about, it's about performance. But I think I said it with San Francisco, um, it became obvious that performance was now, the little projects you can't really talk about in terms of their, their 
their um, influence, environmental performance, urbanism, they're just, they're more or less small projects that do, are about design, right? As the projects get larger, they start having impact in, in city making. And in the case of San Francisco, it was now kind of a, an icon. It had a plaza. It was, it was the, could be the main plaza of the Mission District. That was going to be a generator. Um, as we talked to um, over up engineering, we, we realized we could take the energy out of it, which it was significant. And it, it was moving us to performance. And after that, now, there's nothing we're doing that isn't performance driven. And in some ways, the design is just the, it's coming out of that definition of performance. Well, and it has its own, we've done some homework now and we have some ideas where we want to go. And, um, and then with that, the office is becoming more and more collective. I didn't mention that, but I, I think it's obvious. Um, my instinct when I was 26 was um, not Tom Main, it was Morphosis, it was collective. Um, the name was old school, architects no longer, it maybe came out of my hate for right I detested Wright, total egomaniac, just disgusting character, just all him, 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 and it, most of the ideas were full of shit. And um, uh, it just, it just, mm. and I came out of the '60s, and I was, there was a collective spirit. The, the, the individual was under attack, and the artist, the hero, man, artist out of the 19th century, kind of the Picasso type, was dead in the water, and. Um, and it was collective, and, and the, the practice, um, it, it, it's always been a collective practice. It's we, not me. And it's, um, it's discourse, it's ideas, and it's where the, I, I'll throw out, I'm the guide for sure. I'm the, I kind of steer the ship. But, but, but we just throw out ideas, and we don't start formally. There's no beginning sketch. It's like, what's, what is the project about? I said it with the school. We just said, what are we, what are we doing? Other than just making a building, can we participate in education? That's the problem, right? And uh, when we did the San Francisco building, it was clearly urban, and it was about the workforce, and so I didn't, we just, I just scooted through these things. Um, we reversed the whole interior, and we put the, the management in the middle, and the staff on the outside, instead of the staff getting the corner windows and the windows, and nobody even be able to see out. That was the biggest, actually in terms of the, uh, the, the client, that was the biggest thing we had to do. That was a big argument because the people did it with the corridor management. <laughs> and we're saying, oh no, you're gonna, yeah. Um, their secretary gets the view, year and inside. And, but we came back, we did studies, Harvard was doing all kinds of management studies, saying no, the manager should be in the middle, not on the edge, blah, blah, blah. But it was moving more and more towards performance in every level, environmental, all kinds of functional, social, cultural performances, urban performances. And um, I would say again, in my teaching, in my work with academia still, um, I don't know if you have to tell me if it's showing up here, but it's, it's definitely showing up in most of the institutions I'm connected with, that the whole notion of design, the way I started, and the way Cyrix started, mm. still does that in a way, as an isolated thing, is, is, is starting to re regress. It just isn't, it's too limited, right? And there's room for a certain amount of schools that can do that, but certainly not, in a, right, at a national level. But does it make sense? And it's getting more strategic, and again, I would ask you, um, I'm finding the young people I talk to now, they think more strategically, tactically, a certain kind of pragmatic. And um, I think our profession today has to operate at a tactical level. And the idea of design, look, I get nice clients and I, I've had a very, very nice run. There's not many people that want architecture in terms of the formal architecture, it's, we're talking to ourselves. It's a, it's a little tiny society. And in this country, worse. And, and as you know, a, a lot of people, especially in the development community, I don't know, they'll do it overnight. They'll do it on a sketch of paper before they go to sleep. Who the hell knows? And, um, and that's the danger of focusing totally on design, that we're, finally we're gonna do facades and kind of little sketches, and then they give it to somebody that actually knows how to put a building together. And that's where the work is. Again, for you young people, the design, come on, it's 10%, right? Maybe 20%, not counting kind of working all the way through the process, right? But the actual first, we call design, right? And the rest of it is the, is the, um, the compulsory, is actually, right? The mechanics, making it work, and make, putting it on budget, building something that you want to build, that you're proud of, that you can actually build. Because finally, um, 
as you know, architecture, there's no, uh, huh, there's no way to bullshit your way out of it. Finally, it's a building, and you, <laughs> it's there, <laughs> and you're looking at it, and you can't, you can't fake it, right? You, you've done it, and you live with it, and that's the joke. You, it, it, you can't get rid of it. And um, so we, we, we know when you can do it or not do it. And um, it also makes the profession really beautiful, right? Because it's, it's, it's constantly this interaction between idea and vision and, 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 and kind of an optimism, a hope that you can produce something of beauty, of, of, of something that's really who we are about as human beings against all the forces against it. And they're everything, right? Um, but that makes it also very rewarding. Ha, ha, ha.